Hey everyone, today we're going to continue with our Tartaria Explain series and in this episode we're going to talk about subterranean networks and underground cities that have been removed from our history and suppressed through propaganda stories meant to hide this ancient civilization. One very famous example is the concept of underground railroads involving the slaves in America. The story has been used to hide the history of America and many of the cultures that actually inhabited these lands. They have suppressed the greatness of many of the aborigines of the lands and don't seem to want us to know that there were in fact many cultures and peoples in America far before Columbus. I want to give a shout out to Dane Calloway. He has some great work on this and even presents a case for Harriet Tubman not being a real person or but a fabrication by our new governments creating this false history. I just wanted to give my perception on this and also add some more details from our research that can help understand what's actually going on here. Now when it comes to underground tunnels in America, I mean where do we start? There's so much to cover for just one video. There's also some suspicion about the above ground railroads as well as to whether or not these were truly created by the Chinese as the story goes. Many of these stories just seem to be a cover up for these were already here when these new migrants came here. They most likely had to dig them up or fix them to get the systems working again. But the story goes that these Chinese migrants had to build over 2000 miles of this transcontinental railroad through rugged terrain including mountains of solid granite. I'm not sure if you've seen some of these mountains that they had to blow through, but it does make you wonder if they truly just did it with dynamite, or was this part of some early civilization that actually had the technology to cut through these mountains? The Transcontinental Railroad was built in six years almost entirely by hand. Workers drove spikes into mountains, filled the holes with black powder, and blasted through the rock inch by inch. Hand carts moved the drifts from cuts to fills. Bridges, including the 700 feet long and 120 feet in the air, had to be constructed to ford streams. Thousands of workers, including Irish and German immigrants, former Union and Confederate soldiers, freed slaves, and especially Chinese immigrants, played a part in the construction, as the mainstream story goes. This whole project started after the fake Civil War, and we have a video on that if you haven't seen it just yet, but they want you to believe that they built this railroad by hand with migrants in just six years. Many of the railroad's builders viewed the Plains Indians as obstacles to be removed. General William Tecumseh Sherman wrote in 1867, quote, The more we can kill this year, the less will have to be killed the next year. For the more I see of these Indians, the more convinced I am that they all have to be killed or be maintained as a species of paupers. This to me seems like another cover up as they wanted to destroy the remaining natives who are most likely related to these ancient builders and they posed a threat to their new narrative so they had to be removed. Now supposedly these natives were in the Great Plains or what it was called in its time the Great American Desert. Major Stephen H. Long considered the area almost wholly unfit for cultivation and of course uninhabitable by a people depending upon agriculture for their subsistence. It was flat, treeless, and arid. Half a century later, the Great American Desert received a new name, the Great Plains. This region consists of the area east of the Rockies and just west of the 100th Meridian. The Dakotas, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, a significant part of Texas and New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, and Montana. Instead of being viewed as an obstacle to America's westward expansion, the plains were quickly transformed into America's breadbasket and the site of many of the country's richest mines. Yet, if it was unfit for civilization, then why did they need to kill the Indians who lived there? Wouldn't they just die out? And also notice that this was the site for some of the most richest mines in America. Maybe these were in fact ancient mines and they needed to destroy the natives who were protecting them. If you haven't seen Tartaria Explained Part 3, Make sure you check it out as it explains how these ancient civilizations went through some great cataclysm and had to result to being barbaric and savages, most likely because they had to retreat into the underground through many of these mines and underground passages to survive. Perhaps the sun went missing for a couple years as mentioned in many native legends. 
There's this idea of mud floods, that there were many high mountains that were destroyed that had great lakes, and also that the land became like quicksand after earthquakes, resulting in liquefaction, sinking many of these ancient buildings into the ground and completely burying others. There were also many events perhaps plasmic in nature that caused buildings to melt and petrify, leaving no remains, but many of the rock formations that we now know of in the great Midwest. These star forts from around the United States are not from the Civil War, but from an older time and many of them are actually buried into the ground. They could have been used as a means of water irrigation and preventing cities from flooding during these times. Now, is there any evidence for these ancient tunnel systems? Well, you have to keep in mind that this information has systematically been removed from our history because what would an ancient tunnel system imply? They don't want you to know that in almost every major city, there's an underground component to the city that has completely been built over. These tunnel systems are all over the US, and many of these have been taken by military in order to create underground communication systems. Many say that these are actually what are responsible for the loud booms heard in many different locations. But what about ancient tunnels? Could the ancients truly create subterranean networks? Many of us have heard of the slave underground railroads which, supposedly from mainstream historians, had nothing to do with underground railroads. The Underground Railroad was a network of secret routes and safe houses established in the United States during the early to mid 19th century, and used by enslaved African Americans to primarily escape into the free states and Canada, according to the mainstream narrative. Now. It's my understanding that this is just a propaganda event for two purposes. To continue the narrative that blacks were slaves in America and never were nothing more. And this idea that the Underground Railroad is just a bunch of safe houses, nothing to do with ancient railroad systems. Is it maybe because they don't want people to know about the ancient tunnel system within the United States that served as a foundation for many cities so they just treat this like an old legend as if it was just a myth or metaphorical. They say that the underground railroads had nothing to do with being underground and or with railroads, however, just like with many other legends, the first settlers were well aware of these ancient tunnels. This is where the legends come from. Yes, there were safe houses and certain routes set up, but there were also these underground passages and railroads that these slaves took in order to leave their jobs. We have to understand that our modern perception of the word slave has become distorted and that most of these individuals were actually a part of a work contract that they no longer wish to be a part of. So they would try to escape along these ancient underground tunnel passage systems that at the time were being used as a railroad transportation system for goods. It also doesn't have to do with just black peoples and in a moment we will cover all the different civilizations that were in America during these times. But all races here had these slave contracts, which were not slaves, but work contracts. They weren't slave owners, but employers, regardless of their skin color. You see, the jobs that we have now in the modern day are called at will employment. Meaning at any time we can just quit and say, you know, I'm not really feeling this anymore and I'm just going to move on with my life. But back then, it wasn't really like that these contracts were much more binding and for longer periods of time. Once your contract expires, you would be freed or released from your contract and duties. Many neighborhoods today are in fact old world neighborhoods from another age and are older than they really tell us, including these so-called plantation mansions that were known for housing slaves are not only owned by many black natives of the land, but had nothing to do with our modern conception of slavery. So the New World historians, what they did was rewrite this as slavery and conveniently made it so all the employers were of one race, white, and all the employees were black and they called them slaves. Now, this type of information may be shocking for many of those who choose to hold on to their victimhood, but this is the only way to be freed from the constrictions that have been laid upon us by the new government that wished to keep us enslaved through identity crisis. Another good point for this is, where are the slave ships? They literally only have one slave ship called the Clotilda found in Alabama and even that's up for debate. They purposely try to set up these situations so that when they find these artifacts, they tell the story that they want you to believe. 
Now, it's important to mention that since the Tartaria phenomena has come out, and along with many of our other secret black history videos and other channels promoting similar content, black supremacists have taken this concept to claim that blacks were the only ones in America and that they were responsible for all the architecture around the world and that whites are but a parasite or mutation who came out and caused genocide and stole their culture and advancements in technology and spirituality. It's not only them, I mean, this phenomenon is happening with the white supremacists as well and the neo-Nazis. The black supremacists are just as bad as the white supremacists, and to be honest, we want no part of that. This video was actually going to be part of the secret black history, but I think that we don't really want to contribute to that anymore, as we've seen several black supremacists on the channel comment some very harmful and dividing rhetoric that is just simply not true. Our intention was never to pander to any race. If you go back and watch them, it was just to stop the current divide that we have now in the modern day. To show that blacks have a connection with Ireland, which most African Americans have no knowledge of. The goal was always to unite and stop all the hate towards different races. Sure, I agree that blacks are aborigines to the Americas and the leftover continent of Mu, or as we know the island of California, but they were not, I repeat, were not the only ones in America at this time and it's the contribution of multiple races that is in fact responsible for the creation of what we now know as Tartaria. Again, we don't want any part in the supremacy stuff of any race, so it's just about time that people stop taking this information to suit their own bias and pushing their own racist narratives to continue the divide that was originally created by the new elite, otherwise known as the Phoenician Venetians. Now from our research, there were three main civilizations in America that contributed to the Tartarian outposts that were here in ancient times. One, the Moors or the remnants of Mu, who came from California and the lands of the Pacific, and those on the east coast of America that sailed in with the inhabitants from Ireland, otherwise known as the Fomorians and the mixed race Druids. Two, the Irish or ancient Scythians who were white but also mixed as well, similar to the Moors who came from Europe. These are told as the legends of the Vikings who first visited before Columbus. This is also related to the stories of the Jews or the ancient Hebrews as recounted by the Mormons. They just came from different areas from around the world. 3. Far Easterners who came from Egypt, the Ottoman Empire, China, Japan, and other Pacific Ring Islands. Many of these races were mixed as well, so it's hard to truly classify this based on just race, as Tartaria was a global empire. What we call Native Americans today are just a percentage of the natives that were already in America. They have been called Tartarians in some text and that these races were created after some great cataclysm. We also have to understand how Atlantis plays into this as well, because it is said that America was a part of this ancient Atlantis, and it has changed significantly over the ages. Aborigine is kind of not the right word to use for any of these types of people because these land masses change after every age, and after Atlantis had flooded, other land masses rose, and so the people had fled all over. At first, there was nowhere to inhabit in the west, so many of the inhabitants of Atlantis ventured out to the east. The Fomorians had already done this before Atlantis flooded and were there when many of the Atlanteans began to migrate into the lands of ancient Ibernia or Ireland and Spain. This is when the Tartaria Age began, and they colonized all of the East Continents, and the Druids, or those from ancient Ibernia, who were a mixed culture, began spreading the ancient knowledge of Atlantis around the entire world. They made their way back to the Western America, or ancient Atlantis, and began creating early civilizations there composed of many different races, far before Columbus or the Spanish had ever came. In fact, these are actually told in the Legends of the Spanish as we've gone over in Tartaria Part 3. They're called the Legends or the Adventures of Esplandian, which talked about these times when the Moors, the ancient Ibernians or Irish, Spanish, and Ottoman empires were all in America or Terra Firma, which were the remaining lands of Atlantis. Many of the buildings of Atlantis actually survived the flood as well and were still intact in these lands of Terra Firma. As we've mentioned that at some point there were cataclysms which caused mass death and or many to retreat into underground. But many of these cities that we know today like New York, San Francisco, 
Chicago, were all created by this Tartarian civilization, and they're still being used to this day because we could not repeat the work that they did so it was hijacked, and that includes the railroads, old world architecture, and underground tunnels. Many cities in fact have underground cities and tunnels as if they were built on even older foundations. What's been hidden from the human race is that 200 to 300 years ago, there was a catastrophic event that left many of the buildings around the world buried up to 20 feet beneath the ground. First, let's begin with some of the most famous examples of these ancient cities and tunnels. Under St. Peter's Basilica and the Vatican Necropolis at depths varying between 5 to 12 meters below surface level, supposedly it is a pagan Christian burial ground with several medium-sized stone mausolea and some other ruins which include a fractured piece of a large triumphal arch. We have all heard about Darin Kuyu in Turkey which is said to be almost 5,000 years old, which is an 18-story underground system. They're still not sure who built it and why, but interestingly, there are other melted stone structures in the area, so maybe they were avoiding some type of catastrophe and were forced to create a society underground. In 1992, in the Chinese village of Longyu, a uniquely curious local named Wu Anai pulled his money with his neighbors to buy a water pump and begin siphoning out the pond in his village. He discovered the first in a series of massive hand-carved caves, the origin of which is almost a complete mystery. The Russian Kremlin, the largest surviving fortress in Europe, it is associated with a number of secrets, including underground tunnels, seems to be buried into the ground quite a bit, secret chambers for hiding treasure, and supposedly, Ivan the Terrible's library that contains several ancient texts from the Old World. The Paris Catacombs are another famous example of underground cities, and some have proposed the bones are actually being used as a battery to generate power. Hidden beneath the streets and bridges of Edinburgh are several underground closes and chambers. Closed off to the public for hundreds of years, these places remained frozen in time, just waiting to be rediscovered. Today. Some of them have been excavated and reopened. There's still many parts that have not been opened to the public and it is commonly known that Edinburgh was built on an ancient city. There are also underground tunnels all over Egypt, beneath the Sphinx, many lost tombs, but most famously, the Labyrinth under Hawara, which is an ancient legendary temple said to contain 3,000 rooms full of hieroglyphs and paintings. Mount Tsurugi in Japan is steeped in mystery According to one local legend, the mountain is actually a giant man-made pyramid, and in another legend says that a hoard of King Solomon's secret treasure lies buried within. A giant snake believed to be guarding the treasure has been sighted on many occasions. The caves of Hercules in Toledo, Spain, are surrounded by mysteries and legends. They summarize in a certain way that the underground tradition of Toledo says that the place was carved by Tubal or Hercules the Egyptian and would be the secret chair from which Hercules himself taught the occult sciences. Now, that's just the surface level, I mean, you can find countless stories like this globally, but there are more that are not that well known, especially in the United States today. It's a glimpse into a hidden world below downtown Chattanooga. Good evening, I'm Natalie Janareski. And I'm Latricia Thomas. Stairways leading nowhere, arched doorways that were once street level are some clues to downtown life before 1880. Stories and rumors still fly about underground Chattanooga. News Channel 9's Beth Newhoff gives us a rare look of what's really there. Walk the streets of downtown Chattanooga today and amid the shops and the restaurants, you'll see evidence of the Chattanooga long forgotten. Mystery surrounds a Chattanooga that existed in the 1800s. Torrential rains caused flooding, devastating downtown on a regular basis. The solution? Quietly raised the town, leaving tales still told of the city that lies beneath. This would have been heading down towards street level. So. Local history buffs Mari Nicely and Matt McGauley take me underground to see evidence of the original Chattanooga the public doesn't see. I think a lot of people think, okay, what they did is they just bricked in all these things and threw a bunch of dirt in. This is what's the most interesting part is, I mean, look at the stonework. But official records of the plant are mostly silent, according to Nicely. 
decorative columns, beadboard ceilings, and arched doorways hinting at the past. We heard about an amazing underground discovery in Leavenworth. We had to send a reporter to get some video. KCTV 5, Saray Chin is live now with what she found underground. Saray? Well, Carolyn, you know, this is downtown Leavenworth, but below my feet, there's an underneath underground mystery down here that not a lot of people know about or can tell us why it was created. We take our descent to the incredible mysteries below. So it definitely does look, I mean, this is obviously a door. It is dark and musty. We're going, going to go up here and you're going to be in another storefront. It is a city perhaps long ago used for commerce. Windows, doors and narrow paths lead you to the storefronts. They were stores of some type. We just don't know what they were selling, who was running them. Jennifer Lemon serves as our tour guide. She works for a title company upstairs and gave us access to the underground. We know that it was pretty secretive, whatever it was that was down here, because not too many people know anything about it. Above is downtown Leavenworth at 4th and Delaware. The underground world stretches several city blocks and possibly beyond. Some speculate this was created in the 1800s. It could have been used during slavery or for fugitives. And then there are the myths and tall tales. Good Monday afternoon. We're getting all ready for Halloween as we open the door on the haunted Shanghai Tunnel Tour. You can take in the Old Town part of Portland. Extremely popular this time of year. We'll let you know, well, you see there, who you might and what you might see during a visit to the tunnels. Berkeley, in his book Death Valley Men Chapter, Old Gold, describes a conversation which he had several years ago with a small group of Death Valley residents. The conversation had eventually turned to the subject of Paihut Indian legends. At one point two of the men, Jack and Bill, described their experience with an underground city which they claimed to have discovered after one of them had fallen through the bottom of an old mine shaft near Wingate Pass. They found themselves in a natural underground cavern which they claimed to have followed about 20 miles north into the heart of the Panamint Mountains. To their amazement, they allegedly found themselves in an huge, ancient, underground cavern city. They claimed that they discovered within the city several perfectly preserved mummies, which wore thick arm bands, wielded gold spears, etc. The city had apparently been abandoned for ages, except for the mummies, and the entire underground system looked very ancient. It was formerly lit, they found out by accident by an ingenious system of lights fed by subterranean gases. They claim to have seen a large, polished round table which looked as if it may have been part of an ancient council chamber, giant statues of solid gold, stone vaults and drawers full of gold bars and gemstones of all kinds. In 1885 coal miners in a small city of Missouri were mining a shaft deep within the earth, when all of a sudden, they broke into a huge underground cavern and the very shocked and curious miners decided to go take a look, even though that they knew that it could be very dangerous. And what they found inside should have changed our history forever. That is, of course, if the reports are true, and there are multiple sources. Now, what they found inside was basically a huge, wonderful buried city. It was said to have incredible masonry, tons of artifacts, stone benches all over the place, metal statues, a stone fountain that flowed with pure clean water that even had a hint of lime in it. And lying beside this marvelous fountain were portions of a giant human skeleton that was three times the size of a regular human. Recent years, local leaders have made it a top priority to keep our young professionals here. That's led to creation of more education and job opportunities, as well as a revamped social scene. Tonight in a special report on Louisville's new nightlife, we also take an exclusive look back at its beginning in a time of gangsters, outlaws, and a secret underground. Here's WLKY's Eric King. Now, you got to be careful going down these steps are pretty steep, so just hold on. I would almost stake my life that Al Capone was here at least once or twice. There was two doors. One of, one of the doors led down and out to the street, and the other door led down to the uh, rascaler where he could run through the rascaler and into the basement kitchen. He could have taken the two series of tunnels and got away from the police. Many consider this the birthplace of nightlife for Louisville's elite. During the 1920s Prohibition era when alcohol and gambling were illegal, this was the place to do it without getting caught.
They are under every house, run along every block, and cover a city of nearly a million people. They are a world of hidden tunnels that few get to see right beneath your feet. And we get to take you down there. Our guide is someone who knows every inch of this labyrinth. My name's Megan Abadie. I'm an assistant engineer for the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission Wastewater Enterprise. I'm part of the division of Wastewater Enterprise, which is called the Collection System Division. It's basically a euphemism for sewers. I crawl through a lot of sewer pipes. That's basically my job. This week in our Hidden Places series, we go to Indianapolis and with Halloween. On a lot of people's minds, the exploration of this hidden place certainly seems fitting. Catacombs are large underground systems traditionally used to bury the dead. They're most commonly found in Paris or Rome, where millions of people are buried. But these elaborate underground systems can be found around the world. My colleague Sarah Whitmire joins us now for the latest in our Hidden Places series. Sarah, catacombs here in Indiana? Hard to believe, right, uh. Joe? But yes, thousands of people visit Indianapolis's city market each day. But I wonder how many know exactly what is below their feet. Monday through Friday, around noon especially, the city market is a popular gathering place. People take their lunch breaks and walk here for a slice of pizza or sandwich. Some sit outside if it's nice and eat at one of the tables. Hundreds of thousands of people have sat on this plaza, listened to live music, maybe enjoyed some lunch and some great conversation and have never known what's sitting below them. The entrance to the catacombs is hidden from public view and there's no outside entrance. You go in through these doors and eventually a set of stairs leads down to the basement. Quickly, the concrete floors are replaced by dirt. More than 140 columns create an underground maze. This is unbelievable, it just keeps going. This space is actually the basement of Tomlinson Hall, a four-story multi-use building constructed in the 1880s. You know, for sporting events, uh, for it was, it was like kind of having your convention center with Lucas Oil, with the Field House, with you know Circle Center Theater, uh, everything went on. It was a heavy building constructed out of brick and Indiana limestone. And, and the, the, this is the reason why there's so many columns is what that does is it brings all the weight down from the building and it distributes oh. it throughout all these columns. The curved ceilings are called barrel vault ceilings and they help distribute the building's weight to the columns. As you walk further into the tangle of columns, you can't help but think about Indiana Jones. The catacombs he explored were beneath the streets in Venice. Welcome back. It's part of Utah history that lives mostly through rumors. Yeah, the existence of a seedy underground world buried beneath the streets of Ogden's historic district. Mike? Yeah, David Dini, the KSL investigators had to dig pretty deep for this story, searching for proof of secret tunnels. Welcome to O-Town, a city fast becoming known for high adventure and a vibrant nightlife. But take it back about a hundred years or so. There was some opium dens. And you'll find that Ogden. All kinds of nefarious things that have gone on here in the last hundred years. Has quite a dark history. From prostitution and prohibition. Welcome to the brothel. To drug smugglers and Al Capone. The rumor is that Al Capone came into Ogden on the train, walked up 25th Street, said, this is too rough of a town for me, and turned around and went back on the train. One thing is certain, this is a town you did not mess with. And if you believe the lore, what was happening above ground is only half the story. People would come in and go out through the tunnels. 24th to 26th. The whole length of 25th Street, you know, whether they were gambling dens or opium dens. The opium, the alcohol. Sort of private things went on here. And poison them, strangle them, kill them, and then they haul their bodies out through the tunnels. The infamous tunnels of 25th Street. Now, some say they went from Union Station all the way to Ben Loman Hotel, while others say they branched out all across the city, eventually leading to Ogden High. Below the sewers and subways of Chicago are over 60 miles of forgotten 19th and 20th century train tunnels. 
this mysterious labyrinth, once connecting the majority of the city's most prominent buildings, has sat in abandonment and disarray for the better part of a century. One of the greatest BS stories of tunnels is the Washington DC underground tunnels. The story goes, Harrison G. Dyer, a Smithsonian entomologist, bug collector, who supposedly, just for fun, constructed a network of tunnels under his home in the prestigious DuPont Circle neighborhood. When found in the 1920s, they were lined with high-end bricks on which were pasted old German newspapers. This started a lot of rumors until Dyer fessed up to his hobby. Some of these tunnels have been implicated in the Pizzagate controversy because of the Elephantis family owns many of the properties directly above them. In Texas, while developing a $58 million Buffalo Bayou Park project in 2011, the BBP discovered this important part of Houston history and transformed what once was a former underground drinking water reservoir into a public space known as the Buffalo Bayou Park Cistern. They have kind of turned this into some type of projection art show, which is kind of pretty cool, but interestingly, they say that they rediscovered it and it also has a striking similarity to the ancient Roman cisterns under Istanbul. I mean, this is the story for every city. I can't even fit the amount of underground cities in the United States into one video. Many have been covered up, or only a few remains are left like old train stations and tunnels that were supposedly just forgotten about. Turns out that many of the underground tunnels were repurposed for troop quarters or military training grounds. They are still making more tunnels to this day called dumbs or deep underground military bases. There are also many more legends as we have mentioned a couple but one that I find very interesting that we've brought up before is the legend of the ant peoples from the Hopis. This barren but beautiful landscape was the place where Hopi gods directed them to build a number of villages made up of pueblos what we today would call stone apartment complexes. Here the Hopi managed to flourish by simply growing corn, beans, and squash with very little rainfall and almost no irrigation. One of the most intriguing Hopi legends involves the ant people, who were crucial to the survival of the Hopi not just once but twice. The so-called First World, or World Age, was apparently destroyed by fire possibly some sort of volcanism, asteroid strike, or coronal mass ejection from the sun. The Second World was destroyed by Ice Age glaciers or a pole shift. During these two global cataclysms, the virtuous members of the Hopi tribe were guided by an odd-shaped cloud during the day and a moving star at night that led them to the sky god named Sotuknang, who finally took them to the ant people in Hopi, Anu Sinem. The ant people then escorted the Hopi into subterranean caves where they found refuge and sustenance. In this legend the ant people are portrayed as generous and industrious, giving the Hopi food when supplies ran short and teaching them the merits of food storage. There's so much to cover when it comes to subterranean networks, but hopefully this was a good introduction to those who may be hesitant to believe that our cities could have been built upon existing foundations or cities, or that many buildings could have been buried deliberately or by cataclysm. These questions truly open the door for us to explore whether or not there was any type of advanced civilization that has been erased from our history, perhaps to keep us ignorant of past cataclysms. Regardless, all we can do is stay curious and hope that our minds may be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is?